Good afternoon, everyone. I'm June Rawl, your IPDATE Director, and I'm here to welcome all of you to Webinar Wednesday, Unleashing Potential, Effective Reading Strategies for Adult Educators. In the fall, many of you were fortunate to attend our face-to-face -face regional trainings titled Unleash Unleashing Potential, Effective Reading Strategies for Adult Educators. There you learned many strategies and I hope you were able to really implement those strategies and use them. But today's webinar, we are going to equip you with more resources and insights and innovative approaches towards reading mastery. But before we get started, I wanna remind you of some housekeeping tips. You all, all of your microphones are muted and you are in listen only mode. Today's presentation is being recorded and it is, will be archived on available on the IPDA website within 48 hours. There you will also find the PowerPoint for this webinar and an accompanying uh, handout that Vanessa will be talking about a little bit later. If you have any questions or any comments, just put it in the Q&A section on your screen. Today, facilitating our webinar is Ms. Vanessa Nicholson, our IPDA trainer. Vanessa, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, June. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you this afternoon. Um, before we get started, I want to share a bit of how we will spend our time together on this webinar. I'm going to briefly review the frameworks and components of reading, and then go over some of the strategies we mentioned in our regional training and introduce some new ones, okay? Starting off with the frameworks of reading, those who attended our regional trainings, we started off discussing the frameworks from the FLDOE site and showed you a way to make those frameworks much easier to read. Now, if you remember, and if you didn't attend the regional training, that's okay. This will be something new that you can learn and some, a, a great way to incorporate those standard strands and benchmarks. So you can find the frameworks on the FLDOE site, but IPDAY has made an easier way for you to look at those strands, standards, and benchmarks. On the IPDAY portal, IPDAY site, we have updated the IPDAY matrix. You can log in to your IPDAY account and access the RLA and ESOL matrices. Also, just to note, once you log in and pull those matrices down, there are activities and lesson plans that correlate to the standard that you can use. Let's zoom in and look up close of what some of these matrices look like. So here I have struck, I have reading informational text, structure and central idea. And um, this is just a screenshot of part of the matrix. Of course it's large, it has all the strands, standards and benchmarks and all the NRS levels, but this is just a screenshot so you can see of what it looks like. So. If you start from left to right, you'll see that um, you have the standards on the left. You have the benchmarks going across from NRS level one. It actually goes all the way up, but just for this screenshot, it stops at NRS level three. And if you look, um, you may see two benchmarks with the same code, especially if you're looking at structure, NRS level two. Um, the reason why is those benchmarks have been separated to display two discrete skills. What I love about this is you can see a clear vertical progression. You can see, okay, in central idea, for example, NRS level one, you can see students are only expected to identify the topic and relevant details. Then when you move up to level two, you can see now, not only are they identifying the topic and relevant details, they also have to identify the central idea and explain how relevant details support that idea. And then if, if you move up to, NRS three, they need to understand to do NRS one and two, but now explain how relevant details support the central ideas, whether it be implied or explicit. Now, I will say I've seen teachers who have blown up the matrix big in their classroom. And if you went to some of our regional trainings, you may have been uh, the prize winner of one of those big matrices, but I've seen teachers use this by once they're done teaching a benchmark or a standard, they may put like a little sticker or put a little dot with a dry erase marker to signify that, hey, I've taught this skill. 
I'm going to pause for a second. I would love to see in the chat if you do have the matrix, if you have logged in, if you've seen it, how have you used it? I would love to uh, just see in the chat some ideas of how you use the if day matrix. Give you another minute or so. For those who have seen it or used it, I would just love to see how it's been incorporated into your classroom. Ah, okay. You've re you've reviewed it online. Thank you. Give it another few seconds. I'm I'm practicing wait time. <laughs> All right. Well, if you haven't had a chance to use it, it's a wonderful tool, a wonderful resource you can use, and you can find it in the IPDA website and, of course, in your IPDA portal. So we're going to move on to the next section, components of reading instruction. And if you came to our regional training, we covered this in, in great detail. So according to the National Reading Panel, there are five components of reading that were identified for reading proficiency. Um, does anyone know what they are? I would love to see in the chat. Does anybody think they know what the five components or five pillars of reading instruction? Phonics is one, correct? That's right. Fluency, yep. Comprehension, yep. Vocabulary. Phonemic awareness, yes. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. Perfect. So phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Each component plays a crucial role in developing strong reading skills. And educators who understand and effectively teach these pillars are increasing the chances that their students learn how to read proficiently. So there are six, we're gonna start at the lower level, phonemic awareness. There are actually six levels to phonemic awareness. Students with good phonemic awareness know how to manipulate the individual sounds. So phonemic awareness is based on sound, not based on the letters, okay? Sounds of spoken English. Phonemic awareness focuses on the smallest unit of phoneme sounds and words. Phonemic awareness can be improved by explicit instruction. Explicit instruction consists of direct teaching of letter sound relationships and a clearly defined sequence. Now in our regional training, we went over explicit instructions that could be used for each level of phonemic awareness. We went over phonemic isolation, blending, segmentation, addition, and deletion and substitution. Now I'm gonna show you another way, another strategy to teach phonemic awareness. And it's something I created called phonemic bingo. And you can actually find this in a handbook. I created a handbook so you can find the phonemic bingo cards there and um, you can find all this in the handbook. But you can have students practice this in small group, practice this in whole group, but it is practicing phonemic awareness, okay? And if you look at the cards, you'll see, you know, how many sounds do you hear in the word bed? Of course, students should say three, but at duh, there should be three sounds in the word bed. Okay. And then if I remove the I in gripe and put an A and to replace the I, what new word do I have? The answer would be great. That's the substitution part of phonemic awareness. Now I did create some cards and you can practice this again in small group and whole group to have your students practice those phonemes, those sounds. What other ways can students practice improving their phonemic awareness? I would love to see some answers in the chat. And I'll pause for a minute. I know we've done explicit instruction, which is about five to 10 minutes a day, where students practice phonemic awareness. This can be practiced whole group or small group. 
But are there any other ideas or strategies that, that can be used for phonemic awareness? Word families, rhyming, great. Rhyming, mm-hmm. Perfect, thank you. Songs, yeah, actually that's a good one. Songs, that's a really good strategy that can be used. I appreciate that, thank you. All right, we'll move on to the next level, which is phonics, okay? So phonemic awareness focused on sound. Phonics focuses on the relationship between sound and letters, not just auditory. It is how spoken sound is represented in letters and words. Students with good word analysis know how individual letters and combinations of letters represent the sound of spoken English, okay? That includes those word patterns, those consonant digraphs, long vowel, silent E, those word families. Adult non-readers have virtually no awareness of phonemes, of sounds, of letter, of letter uh, correspondence when it comes to phonics. They may have difficulty applying letter sound knowledge in order to figure out new or unfamiliar words by reading. When adult beginning instruction includes alphabetics, it increases reading achievement, okay? Now, if you came to our regional training, we did go over some word families and different strategies to practice using phonics, but I also created another strategy. And you might be familiar with this one. In our training, we did a bunch of puzzles. And the way this is played is, if you look at this, they're puzzle pieces. Even though you see a rectangle, it's a puzzle piece. And um, this is also in the handbook. I created a bunch of digraph puzzles. And what you would do is you would cut out each puzzle piece and scramble them up. This can be done whole group or small group. Students would need to match each digraph, each word part to the word, okay? That's getting familiar with students saying words, uh, corresponding those digraphs and those letter sound relationships. This can be done with any word pattern. It can be done with silent E, it could be done with long A, it could be done with a lot. And um, I actually like using puzzle pieces because there's many different ways you can incorporate puzzle pieces into a game when it comes to reading. Are there any other phonic strategies that you wanna share in the chat? Video, yep. Videos, video's a great way where students can see uh, the word being pronounced and uh, the word can flash across the screen. Video is an awesome way. Flashcards, absolutely. They go over those patterns, get familiar with those patterns. You can also use decodable readers. I've been told there's adult decodable readers that are not uh, childlike, that adults can read. And if you don't know what a decodable reader is, it is a pattern that is provided in a short passage and students will keep uh, actually reading that pattern. So it might say, Jake went to the store to bake a cake. The pattern would be the long A silent E, Jake bake cake. Um, that would be a decodable reader. That's another way you can practice using phonics. And I love all the strategies that were provided in the chat. Thank you so much. We'll move on to the next component, which is fluency. Fluency is the ability to read with efficiency and ease. Fluent readers can read quickly and accurately and with appropriate rhythm, intonation, and expression. Individuals who are learning to read are often not fluent. Their reading is choppy and filled with hesitations. They make false starts and mistakes in pronunciation. I mean, students who are usually not fluent end up being really frustrated with reading because it takes them a really long, long time uh, to read a simple passage. So it's really important that we have our adult readers learn to read fluently. Now, in our regional training, um, I provide an example of a fluent reader and a non-fluent reader. And I had us read a passage together where all the words were jumbled up, all the words were smashed together. And it was really hard for us as fluent readers to read because we were trying to figure out where the word began and where the word end. And we were saying, imagine that for an adult reader trying to, to read. If you're not fluent, you're normally not comprehending what you're reading because you're too busy trying to figure out 
how to pronounce or how to say the word, that comprehension is, is sometimes not even there. So a strategy that can be used for fluency besides, of course, repeated reading, modeling, reading the text over and over, timing a student. Of course, those are all great strategies, but a fun way to practice fluency is a game that I created called Fluency Expressions. So to play this game, you will need a passage, an article, a paragraph, just something that students can read, okay? You'll divide students into groups. Students will shuffle the cards face down. And when it's a player's turn, they'll draw a card and they'll read a passage according to that expression in an excited way, in a sad way, in an angry way, in a happy way. And then the rest of the students in the group will guess what expression the student is reading the article in. That's just a fun way of how to practice fluency. Again, I have several of these cards in the handbook for you that you can definitely uh, use once you wanna divide your students into groups. Are there any other ways or any other strategies that you've seen to practice fluency? in the chat. I would love to see it. <laughs> Use a ruler while reading. Yep. Mm -hmm. Timed reading. Reading with students, graph results. Yep. They can also use their finger. Mm -hmm. They can record themselves and listen to their own reading. Absolutely. Those are all really, really great strategies. Choral reading, that's another good one. Mm -hmm. You can also model like you read a passage and then they repeat after you and read the passage so they can see how you're reading it fluently. That's also another way. Those are all really good strategies. Thank you. All right, now we'll move on to vocabulary. And I put the Scrabble game there because every time I think of vocabulary, I just think of Scrabble. I don't know what it is, but I remember as a child, I would have a dictionary and try to look up and who can make the longest word. So Scrabble always reminds me of vocabulary. So a person's vocabulary consists of the individual words whose meanings he or she knows and understands. Reading vocabulary comprise those words that we know and understand as we read. So there are a lot of different strategies that we can use to do vocabulary. I believe in our regional, tra regional training, which you'll see in, in, you know, in the upcoming slides, we did a graffiti wall, we did heads up, we did a bunch of different games that I'll show you um, as a review to practice vocabulary. But here are some other game ideas you can use to practice vocabulary. You can create a vocabulary escape room. I know that that might be a lot because <laughs> you have to, um, great different uh, puzzles and different things, but it's a fun way for students to learn. You could do vocabulary crossword puzzles. Of course, we all know vocabulary bingo, vocabulary matching, vocabulary heads up, and I will show you a heads up game, vocabulary Jenga. I, I still actually have my Jenga from back in the day, but um, in vocabulary Jenga, you can write the vocabulary words on the Jenga puzzle piece and students have to pull it out and uh, define the word before putting it on top. That's the way you can do it. And then of course the vocabulary graffiti wall, which I will show you in the upcoming slides. Um, and I actually love a graffiti wall. I think it's uh, creative and um, it's fun. I, I wish they had it when I was uh, in school. So here's another game that you can play with vocabulary. And um, I call this vocabulary matching 2.0. So basically, Students will write each vocabulary word on two cards, shuffle the cards, place all the cards face down. Each player takes a turn flipping over two cards at a time. If the player flips over two cards that match, that have the same word, the player must define the words to keep the cards. If the player cannot define the word, the player flips the cards back over. And then the ones with the most matches, of course, win the game. A variation to this, think of synonyms and antonyms and homophones, right? flip two cards over that have similar meanings. They have to say what it means and they keep the card. What about antonyms? Flip two cards over that have opposite meanings, right? So think of the variations you can use, but this is an easy, quick game that can be created really quickly for classroom usage. Are there any other fun ways or fun strategies to teach vocabulary that you would love to share in the chat?
word search and puzzles, vocab stories, vocabulary bingo, where they match the meaning of the word on their bingo cards. That's right. I love that one. Oh, I love an I have who has. I love it. Like, I, that's probably one of my favorite games. I have who has. <laughs> vocabulary bingo. Great. All good strategies. Thank you. And then the last component of reading, the final component, would be comprehension. Reading comprehension is, is the process of constructing meaning from what is read. To comprehend, a reader must decode words and associate them with their meanings. Phrases and sentences must be dealt with fluently enough so that their meanings are not lost before the next ones are processed. Since understanding the message must occur without face-to-face -face contact, comprehension relies on what can a reader derive from the text based on prior knowledge and past experiences. Readers must continuously monitor their comprehension of meaning to identify how they comprehend the text, okay? Now, in our uh, regional training, we did go over some strategies of comprehension, which we'll review, but I also wanted to list some comprehension strategies here. Many, I'm sure most of you know, of course, graphic organizers, close reading, text-dependent questions, meaning they have to find the answer to the question in the text, SQ3R, KWL chart, exit tickets, model, and think aloud. There's a ton of other comprehension strategies that can be used, okay? An important component to teaching comprehension strategies is to model the strategy first and tell students when they should apply the strategy. Many times students will have all these strategies in their toolbox, but when it comes to reading, they don't know when the strategy should be applied. So when you are teaching comprehension strategies, ensure that students know when to apply the strategy. Now, another strategy that can be used are comprehension cubes. And I created this one, and this one is based on central idea. Um, I went right to the framework uh, standards and benchmarks, and I looked at those uh, benchmarks and I created uh, questions based off that. So this is a cube, of course it's flat, but um, if you cut it out and fold it up, it becomes a cube. And um, you will need an article or story with this cube, but students can, you know, work in groups, toss the cube, and then answer the question. This can be done also independently. What other ways, and by the way, this is also in your handbook. So this is already there for you and you can use in your classroom. What other ways can you teach comprehension? There's a lot of different ways. I'll give it a couple more seconds to see if anybody has any strategies they want to list in the chat. Yep. Focus on making inference to better understand the material. Yeah. And inferencing is a hard skill because it's sometimes it's not, well, a lot of times it's not right there. You have to use what you know, plus the story clues to make the inference. So yeah, that's a very good one. Give it another second or two. Ask for support from the passage, provide proof. Yep. Where's your text evidence? That's what I used to say. Where's the evidence? <laughs> Beach balls with comprehension questions. Love that one. Ball gets tossed around. Um, I love that one because it has the students getting up. They're not just sitting down. And whatever they touch, they must answer the question. Love that one. Identify main idea. Great. All good strategies. All right. So... In our uh, regional training, some of this material you may have already seen, but I want to really review it really quickly for those who haven't seen it. So in our regional training, we started off with uh, some strategies and games to teach vocabulary and comprehension with contextualization. Now, one of the strategies we used was a graffiti wall. And a graffiti wall is a tool that can be used to teach vocabulary words. It actually can be used to teach a lot of things, but basically, what this wall is, is you get it like chart paper and you write the word and students can use words, pictures, hashtags, whatever they want when it comes to telling you the meaning of the word. Now I chose the word restaurant in case there were any teachers or instructors with us that were um, teaching IET or contextualized instruction 
they can use those uh, words and put it on the graffiti wall. Now, there are many ways to do, you can actually do idioms on graffiti wall too. There are many ways to do it. What other way do you think you can use a graffiti wall in your classroom? And when I taught, there was something called a word wall and I'm sure that's still evident, that's still there today. But graffiti wall is, I, I really like it. Is there any other thing you think you could do with the graffiti wall? Mm hmm draw pics. You can ask the comprehension question. You can check for understanding. The goal of the graffiti wall is for students to express it in any way they choose. They may not ex express in the traditional format. That is the goal of the graffiti wall. Mm -hmm. They can add new words that they've learned, flashcards, yep. There's a lot you can do with the graffiti wall. And when we did it in the training, um, it was really wonderful to see what everybody wrote when it came to restaurants. Some wrote money, some wrote friends, some wrote good food, some wrote a peace sign. I mean, it was it was it was a, it was a good way to you know go through what everybody thought of the word restaurant and why did they write that and what did they associate it with. So a graffiti wall is a great way. It's something simple. It takes less than five minutes to put up. You could do it once a week or every day in your classroom if you choose. Also in our regional training, we did an I have who has game idiom style. And, you know, it would say something like, I have, let's see, I have raining cats and dogs. Who has the idiom that means this? And the other person would say, I have this. Who has the idiom that means that? And there were about 40 cards and there's a lot of idioms, surprisingly. <laughs> there's a, there, there are thousands of idioms, actually. So no one, no one will ever know all of them. So it was a great way to teach idioms. But of course, students will have to know some of the idioms to play this game. But it was fun and we had a great time. Um, another way you can teach idioms are through books, passages, short movies. I don't recommend teaching idioms by giving students a long list to memorize. That's, to me, that's not the best way for students to understand idioms. Idioms are already difficult to understand because they don't mean what it actually says. So the I have, who has game was really a fun way. Did anybody come to our regional training and has played the I have, who has game? And if so, how did it go? All right, and if you did play the game, I hope it went well. If you haven't yet, it would be a fun game for you to play. We also did puzzle pieces on figurative language. Now, thinking of those digraph puzzles I've had, what we did here is we put the type of figurative language, whether it would be alliteration, simile, metaphor, idiom, we put that up top, and then we gave an example of that figurative language and then a definition. And we scrambled it all up. And then in groups, instructors had to match the type of figurative language with the example, with the definition. I already, I know I had some feedback from that already that they took the game and played it with their students and it was wonderful because they just got finished teaching a unit. If anybody came to our training was able to play this game, I would love to know how it went. Oh, perfect. Your teachers love that game. Perfect. Yeah, it was a good one. All right. There were other games such as Memory Match, Heads Up, and Off Limits. Um, and each training might have chosen something different. But for my regional training, I chose Heads Up because I actually really like that game. And with Heads Up, there was a list of um, cards, and they were prefixes and suffixes. And what instructors had to do was they would draw a card and put the card on their forehead facing out. And then the group members would have to give them clues of the word, but not tell them the word, okay? So it was really fun because we played it with prefixes and suffixes and they would say, um, full of, or, you know, they <laughs> in a certain way. And um, they really, really liked that game. A different way to differentiate this game when it comes to contextualizing it would be, you can do it for, prepare professionals or business. 
You could think of words that are associated with it. And you can still use prefixes and suffixes if needed, but take those words and have students sort of, you know, practice guessing what those words mean and associating what those words mean. So I chose helpful, friendly, cheerful, communication, collaboration, responsibility. Those are words that are needed. Well, those are characteristics and words that are associated with people, with those who are going to be a paraprofessional or be in business. So to play this game, shuffle the cards, put them face down, put students in group, a student would take the card up, put it on their forehead, and the group members would give them clues about the word. The student holding the card on their forehead would have to guess what the word is on their forehead by using, this, by using the clues that the students provide. You can do this game with uh, lots, lots of things, lots of ways, but um, you know, you can also contextualize it. Yeah, heads up is good for vocabulary practice. It is, it really, really is. I absolutely love it. We had a great time, the instructors, we had such a great time. This is one of um, our favorite games that we actually did within the regional training, all right? Also in our regional training, we use the GIST reading strategy. Um, instructors were given an article and the article um, may have been, I believe the article was about healthcare or health, home health aides. And within that article, um, the text was read, you had to list who or what the text is about, the most important thing about the who or what, and use 20 words to write the central idea for the text. So the basis of using the GIST reading strategy is to get to the central idea. You know, a lot of times when you're working with students and you try to get them to do the central idea, it could be a whole paragraph of like six sentences and it's like, no, we just want the main point, the most important point. So this GIST strategy that I laid out in a graphic organizer is a great tool that can be used. And this was also done in the training. This is also part of your um, workbook that I created as well. Did anybody get a chance to implement the GIST reading strategy in their classroom as yet, those who went to the training? All right. Another strategy we used was called sum it up strategy. It was um, helping students write a summary. Again, you would give students a text. They would read the text. They would do the five W's and an H. Sometimes there's not five W's and an H though in a text and that's okay. Whatever is there, they list. And then we put it in a tweet where they would have to give no more than 20 words um, in a tweet format. And that was another strategy that was used. Was anyone able to use the sum it up strategy? Right. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to try uh, sum it up or gist within your classroom and let us know how your students like using the strategy. Taking the sum it up strategy, we also decided to do graffiti wall. So again, as you can see how a graffiti wall can be used, that tweet that they, they created at the bottom, you can have students do a graffiti wall. And of course, these are all, you know, <laughs> student one, student two, student three. And they can put their summaries on the graffiti wall. They can put hashtags. They can put likes in form of hearts. Um, you know, a student. You know, I pretended to have a student that has a blue check mark. That's official. It could be a fun way. So again, incorporating the graffiti wall that is for vocabulary. This is another way you can incorporate it when using uh, some of the, the sum it up strategy or the just strategy. So I just wanted to incorporate that back. We also talked about making inferences and we talked about you can, you know, use making inferences by starting off with like a picture, you know, a lot of times we want to move to what the students know and what's in the text. But when you start off with making inferences, I generally start off with the picture first. So students can talk about what they see and what they know to make the inference before moving down to evidence in a text. So we also talked about just providing pictures. These are pictures that you can get from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. You know, students can talk about, you know, I see someone, they have a stethoscope, um, they look like they're in a medical facility. I see someone getting their blood pressure checked. 
I believe this person is here for an appointment, a medical facility. That can be an inference using what you know with what you see to make the inference. We talked about how to move that into text. So we talked about using this, use of pictures, what you see, what you know, makes the inference and eventually moving students to text. What I know plus evidence in the text then makes the inference. We also talked about how you can use a Venn diagram to do it as well. What you know and evidence in the text creates the inference in the middle, you know? In the past, I would never think to use a Venn diagram for inferencing besides comparing and contrasting because that's what it's known for. But here's another way that you can use a Venn diagram. You can use it in inferencing. Are there any other strategies that you want to list in the chat that can be used for inferencing? All right, as you're thinking of those ideas, I'm gonna go ahead and continue. We also played a who am I game when it came to inferencing. Um, we had different riddles on a card with clues and there was clue one and clue two and students had to, or the instructors that we were playing with had to guess using the clues and what they know what the riddle was. They also had a great time doing that. I don't know if um, some of the instructors got to playing this game, but if you did, I would love to know how it went. All right. Give it another few seconds. Mm -hmm. Reading stories and what's not being said between the lines. That's right. Because inferencing is that, that skill that's not usually right there. Mm -hmm. Make predictions. Right, let's move it on. And then um, there is a new strategy that we didn't introduce at that training that I'll introduce now. Um, it's, it's connecting ideas. It's connecting ideas with those technical texts. Um, and that's one of our benchmarks as well. But with this strategy, you can take any procedures, any steps, and um, I use hand washing for those that are contextualizing their, their instruction. You can use um, anything with procedures in a text. And what you will do is you will cut out the cards and shuffle them. Have students place the cards in order after it's shuffled. And it could be procedure that that's 10 different steps. You know, this one's short, but you need, but once students put the cards in order and it can be done in a group format, you can ask the students, why did they put the steps in that order? What would happen if you put this step before another step? What would happen if you took this step away? And what would happen if you added this step? You know, this is a great way to show how to connect ideas in, uh, in a technical text. And again, this is a short, this is short procedure, short steps of hand washing. But if you are contextualizing instruction, this is also another great strategy, great tool you can use. I've used this before and students really love it. And they love discussing like, okay, I put this step here because I don't know, it makes sense, but why does it make sense? What would happen if I, you know, what would happen if you did this before this, you know? So that's another good strategy you can use. Well, I think we are coming to the end of the webinar and thank you for spending time with me. I did see a comment that, um, someone wasn't able to access the matrix. Um, 
and I had my email address in the beginning. Um, and this PowerPoint is also going to be uploaded. Um, if you email me, I will. I have no problem walking you through of how to find the matrix on the IFDA portal website. I can totally help you do that. So um, email me and I, I don't mind walking you through that. So thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. And I'm going to turn it over to June. Vanessa, thank you so much. And thank you all very much for all your comments and your contributions. It was really fun to, to watch the webinar. Before you leave us today, would you just please take a, a minute to fill out our feedback survey? Um, it's just really important for us to understand how you felt about the webinar. While you do that, I'm going to remind you that on February 27th, it's a Tech Tuesday. We're going to have a Tech Tuesday on mastering Microsoft tables. It will be a presentation on harnessing the power of data organization. So I hope that all of you can join us and you can um, tell your staff to join us as well. And Vanessa, thank you so much for sharing all these rich resources with us. And thank you all in the field for all you do. We'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day.